Hello, hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of Fluently Forward. We are here at the Pod Movement Conference recording live, and I am here with Jen Briney from the Congressional Dish podcast. How's it going? It is great. Thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to have you on. I've been binging your podcast, and I think it is a pot. Like, I feel like you should be getting paid by the government or the people to do <laughs> your show because. It's basically you cover everything. And I think you phrased it really well, where you cover everything that happens in government, but not in politics. So like after people are elected, what's happening with the bills? Who's saying what in Congress? How would you describe your show and what like inspired it? I think you described it really well. I think there is a distinction between talking about government and talking about politics, where a lot of people turn off the news because politics is so toxic it's like the he said, she said, the campaigns, who's raised the most money. Like, who cares? Yeah. I want to know, you know, so much of my income goes towards taxes, right? So I want to know what they're doing with it. I want to know, you know, like, what war are you sending my friends to next? Yeah. I think that's the important stuff. After we elect people, they have two years if they're in the House, six years in the Senate to make the laws that determine you know, how much money we keep in our bank accounts. Um, in a lot of cases, like with healthcare, like whether we live or die or go medically bankrupt, like these decisions are so important. They affect, they affect us directly. Mm-hmm. And so that's why I started paying attention to government. And it really started in, um, it was 2011. And I was doing something that all the cool girls do. Mm. And I was watching uh, C-SPAN while I was cleaning. <laughs> cool, cool girl activity. Yeah, really cool stuff. Um, But the reason I was doing that is my husband was a solar engineer. We were living in Boston at the time, Mm -hmm. and the state credits were going away. And so I wanted to see, was there anything federally that might have some hope because we were poor? And it was just like, what are my husband's job prospects? Where should we move? And so I was just trying to get an idea of what the feds were thinking. So I'm watching C-SPAN, and I see this congressman from Oklahoma who's still in Congress get up and brag about the fact that he had successfully inserted an amendment into that energy and water funding bill that protected secret campaign contributions. Mm. And I'm watching this and I'm going, not only can I not believe that he would do this, but to brag about it? Well, and also you're watching it. You're probably one of like 17 people watching it. Like, yeah. like n- nobody I know watches C-SPAN. Some people <laughs> I, like don't even know that it exists, you know? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if people don't know what C-SPAN is, um, they have three different channels. So the C-SPAN 1 network covers the House of Representatives. So anytime the House is working, the C-SPAN cameras are rolling. Um, C-SPAN 2 covers the Senate. And then C-SPAN 3 is actually my favorite because they cover the hearings or some of the hearings. I now know that there are like 20 hearings that happen at a time and C-SPAN only has three cameras. So they don't cover nearly as many as they could, but they're doing the best they can. So I was watching C-SPAN 1 when this happened. But at the time, I knew nothing. And so I just assumed, like, this is a scandal that was just on television. Yeah. Obviously, Rachel Maddow is going to want to talk about this. So I get all excited. And at 6 p.m., I turn on the television. She doesn't even mention it. And Fox doesn't mention it. CNN doesn't mention it. And so then I turn to the Internet. No one wrote about it. Like, it was like it never even happened. There wasn't even a blog. You know, this was 2011. So I started watching C-SPAN, C-SPAN more regularly and started kind of looking into the congressional record. I had taken business law in college, so I wasn't intimidated by the bill language. And I learned that this kind of stuff happens all the time. Yes. Today's episode of Fluently Forward is brought to you by Next Evo Naturals. You've heard me talk about them before. They are a CBD company. They're the only CBD that I use. I really like the fact that I found a company here where you know what you're going to get because I feel like CBD, not to put my tinfoil hat on, but it doesn't always do exactly what it says in the label, especially when you read the fine print. But I love the CBD uh, gummies here that I take with Next Evo Naturals. These really help me if I'm stressed, if I'm feeling anxious, if maybe I'm tossing and turning and having some trouble sleeping, um, I will just go to these gummies. And then they also come in pill form, if that's something that you prefer. I just find the gummies fun. And they use this thing called um, Smart Sorb Technology. So it's clinically proven to help your body absorb this CBD four times faster than regular CBD oil. So you can upgrade to better natural solutions from Next Evo Naturals. Go to nextevo.com and use promo code FLUENTLY to get 25% off. That's 25% off at nextevo.com with the promo code FLUENTLY. 
Can I ask, are you, because there are so many things where I feel like I sound like an absolute nut job, but I try to pay attention to some things that are going on, but a little bit in this conspiratorial angle. Are you a conspiracy theorist or does paying attention to the government kind of make you one? Because from my experience, there are so many things where a bill will get passed or nobody will be talking about it. Or like you said, there was something that I was looking up where the Patriot Act was extended and the day that it was extended, it wasn't covered on any of the major news sources. And I'm like, there, like, why? There has to be a reason why big things aren't being covered. What do you think about this idea of the government like working with media or trying to hide things from us or trying to slip things under? Do you trust the government fully? Do you not trust any of it? What's your take? So the thing about talking about the government, the government is a collection of people funded by taxes. It pedophiles. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> well, some of them. Um, but just like any private corporation, you can have dirt bags in it and you can have really good people in it. And in government, we have excellent public servants and we have garbage people like and not like, you know, garbage people do good work for us. I'm talking like the humans themselves are the garbage. Garbage people do work for the government. Uh, some of them. OK. Yeah. In New York, the mob picks up the, the garbage. It's a whole thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's a story for a bar. I'll tell you how I know that yeah, every time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but yeah. So but that's the thing, right? Like there are things that we all need. So when I look at like what the government should do. I look at the services that we all need that we can't fund on our own. So I can't personally build a highway, you know? I can't personally have a heart surgeon and a brain surgeon and a firefighter and police on standby. I'm not Elon Musk, I can't afford that. And so when I look at the functions of like what I want government to do, it's all the stuff that we all need on standby. That's what I think government should do. And there are people that are absolutely on board with that in government. So when we talk about, you know, the government does this or the government does that, it's too broad to have that discussion. Like you really have to talk about the individuals because the reason that I honed in on Congressional Dish um, when I started it, because I knew nothing, for the first two years, I read every bill that passed the House of Representatives. And I focused on the House of Representatives because I didn't realize that we can fire every single one of them every two years. So in Congress, we have 535 people. 100, 100 of them are senators. 435 of them are in the House, and we can fire them all. How often does that happen? Somebody gets fired. So that's the problem. Not very often, because we all focus so much on the presidency. Like right now, we're, we're already talking about Trump and Biden as if they're the nominees, as if like the primaries have even happened. Yeah. And it's nonstop discussion, nonstop coverage. It's insufferable. And I understand why people turn that off. But what really affects us is the three people that affect uh, that represent us in Congress. And most of us, if we're paying attention at all, know our senators. Very few people know who represents them in the House. Well, do you think that there's a like I kind of have this working theory that I feel like some industries are set up to be purposely confusing or disheartening so that way we don't get involved. Like I, I, I look at the language around your health insurance and I'm like, I feel like there's a way they could explain like I'm five of this, but they just don't. They don't want to buy a house or like the stock market, like anything like that. I think it's made confusing on purpose. And I think the government, <laughs> the government, some mm -hmm. people in them, I think that that happens as well because I think a lot of people just, um, experience like hopelessness and a sense of being disheartened and not a sense of I'm a citizen with power and together we can change and I know that there's that quote right where it's like your government should be scared of you you shouldn't be scared of your government yeah so what would you say are some misconceptions where we as citizens have way more power than we would think an opportunity to change something versus like this is something that we don't have a say in I think people, especially in the younger generations, are underestimating how much our votes matter mm. because everything that these politicians are doing, it's courting votes. Like they really care about the votes. And that's one of the reasons that they focus so much of what they do on the boomers, because the boomers vote and we don't. And so if you think about like the campaign finance system, what are they raising the money for? They're raising it to influence votes. They're raising it to spend on media ads to influence votes. They're trying to get on podcasts so that they can get into your ears so that you'll vote for them. Like, it really is the votes that control things. And so every two years, these members of the House are going out. They, they act like campaigning is their job. Mm. 
So they kind of work in year one. So we're in 2023. They kind of worked this year. In 2024, it's campaign year. So they're going to kind of disappear. But where they're disappearing to is their own districts in order to convince you to show up to the polls and vote. So that is where we do have power. And so this whole idea that, you know, if I vote, I'm participating in a corrupt system, like that seems to be a popular thing going around. Isn't it like 50% of people don't vote? No, I think it's more than that. Jesus. It's bad. And when you look at the age brackets, it really is the elderly that are controlling this country. Well, there also are some things where like, don't they like bus people in to like from the, you know, elderly homes to like go vote and then like bus out. Like I remember different Veep episodes where it was all about just trying to get old people to show up and vote for them because every vote counts. Yeah, get out the vote drives. I mean, I remember in the 1990s, they were aiming get out the vote drives at younger people. So I turned 18 in the year 2000, and I remember they were aiming so much of that at me. Well, why not? And I think it's in a party bus. Because if somebody it took me in a party bus to go vote, <laughs> me and all of my friends, I feel like people would say, has anybody ever done that? Like, what's the craziest thing you You know, I think that would be a really good idea. Again, I cover, I cover government, not really politics. Yeah, 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 yeah. But what I have noticed with politics is they are still aiming at older generations. Like, the people in power right now, you have to keep in mind that Nancy Pelosi was in charge of the Democrats in the House until, I don't know, five months ago. And she's 80-something years old. Can we talk about, what's her name, Diane uh, Feinstein? Feinstein. Or Die Fi. She is 90. 90. 90. <laughs> okay, that was it. And yeah. she recently, like, there was some controversy because you're supposed to say I or nay to show your support of bills. And instead of saying I or nay, she started, like, delivering this speech. And everybody was like, just say I, just say I. She also recently gave power of attorney to her daughter. Yep. So that was something that a lot of people were saying. You are giving like your power of attorney to your daughter, but you're signing off on bills for us. But you can't even I mean, this is the argument. You can't even make decisions for yourself. Your daughter has to. What the hell do you think is going on with all of these old people? I don't want a 70 and 80 year old duking it out for presidency. Do you think we're ever going to put a cap on this? So. I think that we have people who have been in power for decades who are just clinging to power. I mean, think I think it is that simple. Do you think that it's like you get addicted to the fame? Like, what's what's your take on these, like, personality types and why they stay in power for so long? Well, first of all, it is quite suspicious that these people go into Congress as regular people, probably upper middle class, and maybe millionaires. Rich. They come out filthy rich. Yeah. Filthy rich. The fact that we allow members of Congress to trade on the stock market is insane. Can we talk about, you were talking about this, I think, in a podcast interview, and this absolutely blew my mind, where you were saying that, I think this was back in 2013, mm -hmm. that people in Congress were making money off the stock market. They were outwardly basically doing insider trading. So they tried- There was a 60 minute special on John Boehner, who was the Speaker of the House. Mm -hmm. And Nancy Pelosi, who became the Speaker of the House, talking about their insider trading. So, yeah, that's how we found out. Go on. Just insane. <laughs> and you said that they were, um, they came up with this idea that it was like a bill that was voted on or something. Correct me on the language. But they were supposed to have a website that was going to be publicly searchable. And it would show the finances of elected representatives, their staffs. This was passed. It was like, woo, handshaking, photographs, fantastic. And then you said that happened, I don't know, on like a Thursday. And then on a Friday, at the end of the day, when everybody leaves, some guy said, oh, how about we pass a bill to get rid of the website? So it was, you're a little off here. So it was called the Stock Act, the Stop Trading on Congressional Knowledge Act. That's a great acronym. Everything fits just right. They are pretty good at that. Yeah. I got to <laughs> hand it to him. So they passed the Stock Act into law in 2012, April of 2012. Okay. And... The, it wasn't going to ban trading by members of Congress. And this all happened because of the 60 Minutes -ish, uh, episode, because we were pissed off, you know? Wow, 60 Minutes. I know, like journalism matters. And so people were mad, and so they were like, we're going to do something about this. So they passed the Stock Act, and it was all about transparency in their trading. So they can keep trading, but we're going to get to know what it is. And so um, it would have required... Which is also insane. Like, what, then you just have to cyber bully them out of doing it, but, like, they still can? Anyway. The idea was that we'd be able to track their trades and be like, you are bad. We're not going to vote for you. Oh, like, okay, right. Okay. So essentially, 
this, the best thing about the Stock Act is it was going to create this publicly searchable website. And it wasn't just going to be the members of Congress, but it would have been their chiefs of staff. It would have been like you talked about. I always wonder who funnels it through, because if I had insider trading knowledge, which manifest, wish I did, I would tell it <laughs> to my sister and like my sister's husband and then he would do it and then I would get kickbacks. You know, these people aren't born yesterday. Well, and like the chief of staff, if you watch The West Wing, Leo McGarry knows everything that the president knows. Mm. So that person can trade just as much, too. So you kind of had to have the staffers be tracked as well. Um, but, yeah, it was supposed to have this website. And so a year later, when all of this was supposed to go into effect, it was April of 2013. Um, it was supposed to go into effect, and what they did was very quietly gut it. And so on a Thursday, I don't remember, I mean, it was 10 years ago, but on one of the day, yeah, no, Thursday was the Senate, and the Democrats were in control, control of the Senate at the time, and there was no one in the room, and one of the senators got up and said, which, by the way, you said that the, there's a phrase for that when a bill passes and no one's in the room, unanimous consent. Yeah, okay. <laughs> so they got the unanimous consent of an empty room yeah, I'll to go pass. I. Yeah, so they gutted the Stock Act by basically making that website go away. And all of the requirements that staffers tell us about their trading, all of that went away as well in this bill that was passed through an empty room. And then in the House of Representatives, they did the same thing. So on a Friday, there was very predictable schedules in the House of Representatives. Everyone had already fly flown home. And the Republican who was in charge of the House got up. His name was Eric Cantor. And he did the same thing. He got the un unanimous consent of an empty room. And then that following Monday, it went to President Obama, who signed it. Mm. And if anyone was going to notice this, they never did, because that was the day of the Boston Marathon bombing. Yeah. And I was living in Boston at the time, so I don't even notice it until Friday. Um, and it got no coverage whatsoever. And that was actually like that's when I realized I had a podcast. Yeah. Because it was the first year I was doing this. I was like, I don't know. This is kind of boring. But that was yeah. insane. So, um, well, there's a lot of people who say that, and I feel like this has kind of come through where people say the government, pa anytime something big happens, the government passes something quietly. So, like, you'll see, you know, these people on Twitter be like, all right, they're talking about aliens and the UFOs, like check for the bills that are secretly being passed. Or there was a moment where uh, March 31st, 2020, obviously the height of COVID, everybody mm -hmm. was focused on that and trying to find a square piece of toilet paper. And that was when Alan Dershowitz became uh, attorney in the Ghislaine and Epstein case. And he sealed like a million pages of different Epstein evidence. But that kind of went unnoticed because people were talking about COVID. So do yeah, I had no idea about that because that was the week they passed the CARES Act, mm. which um, was not written the way it was supposed to be written. You know, we hear a lot now about people taking COVID money that weren't supposed to and all of the waste and fraud. I read the CARES Act right after they passed it. And just the way it was written was madness. First of all, Stephen Mnuchin was the Treasury Secretary. He's not supposed to be writing bills, but it was written by Stephen Mnuchin Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer, I believe. I think Mitch McConnell might have been there. But it was basically behind closed doors with the Treasury Secretary. Like, hard no. That's not how it's supposed to happen. It's supposed to be in committees. But that Congress decided that even though they were elected to serve the public in emergencies, they thought their priority should be getting home to be with their families where I think that they should have all been living in D.C. to run the country during a international pandemic. Yeah, it's giving, what's his name, that guy who left during Texas when there were, like, hurricanes? Ted Cruz yeah. vibes. Yeah. yeah, the whole Congress decided that's what they should do. Yeah. So, um, but do you notice a trend of, like, things being passed in secret or at least not talked about or reported on because it's happening at the same time as um, the Super Bowl or some sort of big event? No. Oh, so, okay. and... I think that's because they don't have to do that. Yeah. No one's because paying no attention. <laughs> it's It seems too hard. It seems like there aren't good stories in there. Or, so I don't think this is conspiracy theory. I think it's backed up by numbers. But the mainstream media is not incentivized to talk about this stuff. Because if you think of the billions of dollars now that we spend on elections, think again, where does it go? It goes from these people that are running campaigns to the media to run ads. So if you think about it, these mainstream media journalists, their customers are not you and I. They're the people that pay them. They're the politicians that are paying for those ads that run on these networks. So when you watch CNN, watch the commercials. 
The commercials are very instructive because that is who is paying for your news. Like, I saw a commercial not that long ago for Raytheon, which, like... What's that? It's a defense contractor. They make weapons. They make planes. They make bombs. What are they advertising for? Like, we're not buying bombs. do of, like, the Super Bowl, you know, sponsored by Pfizer and stuff. And I know a lot of Europeans come over here and they're like, why do you have ads for... Uh, you know, asthma medication and this showing a stock footage of like two people blowing out a birthday candle and they're like, meanwhile, you could get diabetes and you could die and your head could chop off. And like, <laughs> yeah. You could get diarrhea forever. <laughs> yeah. yeah, for sure. But that's who's paying for your media. So when you wonder like, why aren't they covering stories about, I don't know, weird vaccine stuff or pills that give you diarrhea forever or Ozempic? Like, why are they only talking about you know, celebrities are looking so good on his Ozempic. Like, why aren't they talking about the stomach issues that people are having? When you wonder why things aren't being talked about, watch the commercials. Watch who's like funding ass of distrust. And I feel like ever since COVID, it, it ramped up. And we experienced this, too, even in the world of gossip, right? Like, people don't believe the tabloids anymore. They come to the blind items, the gossip, you know, trying to be their own detective. I think we saw a lot of people um, stop watching or trusting the news. And like once you once an industry loses trust, you really don't get it back. I know. So and we need them. That's the tragedy. Yeah, we need them. So um, I'm to like say, you know, obviously, I think there's a lot of corruption or, you know, money changing hands. If you got to rule and institute some sort of law and you could change one thing to make everything better, would it be? not donating to politicians would it be yes age ca- okay that would be your one thing yeah because our system is based on bribery it really is like the amount of money that is washing around with these people it is i think it's the heart of all of the problems that we have i think it's one of the reasons that because you can use a lot of the campaign money on yourself right like yeah. like you can't do some things but like you can pay for your child care and your that like a I know everybody, right? Like AOC wears a tax the rich dress, and then everybody's like, "This is exactly how much her outfits cost every single day." Or people talk about Nancy Pelosi getting her hair cut. Strangely, I never really see it for the male politicians. It's usually the female. I think it's all out in the open. It's like these parties that you're having every few days in your honor. Those are campaign events, but they're parties in your honor. They're open bar. They're you know, amazing steak dinners where everyone's hobnobbing and like it's it's this lifestyle and it's basically free. It's paid for by billionaires. And and if people, you know, donate to politicians, I don't. But some of them crowdfund this lifestyle. It's a very weird thing to do. In other countries, they run their elections for a couple of months before the elections. Having these multi-year election cycles, what we do here is weird and it's unhealthy for us. So I think I would make giving money to politicians just straight up illegal, especially with the internet. We don't need it anymore. You don't need to like send out crap in the mail. We don't need it. You don't need the ads on television. And I get so excited. I'm like, oh my God, seven text messages. And they're all from people being like, please, I live in Arkansas. And I'm like the Democratic rep. And I'm like, we got it. Now I'm getting like texted by everybody. So it's interesting too. I think about people who run or want to be in government but they're already rich so like donald trump rudy giuliani what do you think makes somebody who already has power and money want to go into politics like do you think that narcissists are kind of driven to this career because i think anyone who wants to be president we should not let them be president and you have to like drag someone kicking and screaming because i feel like they would actually have the right moral compass for the job rather than just wanting notoriety so i mean I don't know these people, so I can't really get what's into their heads. Oh, that's but, fine. You don't have to. Well, from, <laughs> from going and doing this job, I do kind of watch them as people, right? Sure. And you kind of, they're not evil. Like, I think most of these people think they're doing good. They just come from a different tax bracket than the vast majority of us. Mm. So they're doing what is good for their I'll say it, the investor class. I think there are two different classes of people. There's people that make money through work and paychecks, and there's people that make money because they have money and they put it in the stock market. The people that do that, the investor class, they treat the stock market as if it is the economy. So while all of us are feeling the pinch right now, like everything is so expensive and our paychecks aren't going as far, and yet we're being told the economy is great because the stock market is great. They are different things. I see the stock market as a tax on 
literally everything we buy. And there are so many people in power right now that are beholden to the stock market and that make, make money from it. And so they think they're doing good. It's our job to replace them with people like us that make money from work and from paychecks and who don't have the money to invest in the stock market. Half of us are not in the stock market at all. Mm -hmm. And then I think it's something like 85% of the stock market money now gets funneled to the top 10% of Americans. Like it's, it's just a like, wealth- Like make you wanna cry. Yeah, it's a wealth, dis re dis wealth redistribution tool yeah. in the upward direction. And so I think that if we just take some of the personal motivations out of it and just look at like, what are you doing? Does this work for me or not? I think we'd be much healthier as a society and as voters to choose, like, are you an investor class representative or are you, are you a worker class yeah, representative? Like, you should make that into a TikTok. That's like a great way to categorize these people like, because I've like, person to tell me to get on TikTok. I get on TikTok. <laughs> Today's episode of Fluently Forward is brought to you by Jenny Kane. If you are like me and you want to dress like Nicole Kidman in every movie or HBO series ever. You know how she's always playing the rich mom and she's married to some billionaire who's like a little bit, you know, evil, but she's wearing these timeless, chic, elegant clothes where she's not trying too hard. God knows she's not trying hard, but she looks fantastic. That is everything that Jenny Kane has to offer. So they're a California brand. They have summer staples. They have staples for every season, okay? They've got flowy dresses, lightweight cotton cardigans, these very luxe cashmere sweaters, the type of dress where you put it on and you could just be like cooking in the kitchen, but it looks so classy, you know? Um, they're cotton fish fisherman sweater. That's a bestseller every year. Everything's very simple but also designed very intentionally so if you want to find your forever pieces at jennycane.com our listeners are going to get 15 percent off your first order when you use code fluently at checkout so that's 15 percent off your first order j-e-n-n-i-k-a-y-n-e.com promo code fluently let getting dressed be one less thing to worry about <laughs> well another question i have for you here is um the UAP hearing, so this whistleblower. With oh, the they were so fun. So I, I've been, you know, trying to pay attention to that. I also think it's interesting that for the first time, the government is talking about aliens yeah. and nobody seems to really give a shit. Maybe that's because we're not in the investor class and there's other things to worry about. Yeah. Maybe it's also because of this distrust of the government. What do you think is going to come of aliens within the government? Like, do you think that they're going to be getting involved and this is going to be like a governmental thing? Or do you think this is just a flash in the pan? So the most fascinating thing. So what I did with those hearings, there were actually three alien hearings um, that have happened over the past two years. So I took all three of those hearings and made a mashup, essentially, of all three of them into one of my episodes. So it's basically a clip show. And I just did it kind of by topic cut out all the fluff with all the politicians and just had the good stuff. And from making that episode, I watched these hearings over and over again. And I think people are missing the plot here because from what I understand, the aliens are not in, or the this craft, they called it like, I love that this is even a conversation we're having now in 2020. I know, like, how is this real life? This is my favorite episode I've done in a while. It was yeah. so fun. Um, but from what David Grush, who is the whistleblower, like, first of all, his qualifications were better than I was expecting. I very, had, very good. Yeah. Yeah. We did a mini free Patreon episode on it, if anyone wants, like, a 20-minute recap. But, yeah, he's he's the real deal. Like, yeah. he's not some, I don't know. He was the guy, he was assigned from two different parts of the government to go to this task force that the Defense Department had set up to collect the reports related to unidentified aerial phenomena, I think is what they're calling it now. Which, by the way, annoying that it went from UFO to UAP. It's right. like, let's just call it UFO. Come on. Well, because I know why they did that. Underwater. Yes, yeah, yeah, which yeah. we found out in the hearing, which was awesome. <laughs> um. <laughs> no, it, it was arguably really, really cool. Yeah, I was so entertained. But what David Grush said that just, I, it's incredible to me. The reason he's a whistleblower was not the fact that he was getting these reports about aliens. It was about the fact that money that is being appropriated by Congress, he says, is being diverted by private corporations into these secret programs. So essentially, Congress is saying this money is going to be for research and development. They're taking some of that research and development. And is that our tax money? Yes. Okay. 
And so you're supposed to report everything that you do with our tax money back to Congress. And what he is saying that there are these secret programs that the corporations are doing with our tax money that is not being reported to Congress. So it's just like a black box. They're not saying what they're using it for. Well, David Grush is saying they're using it for all the alien, alien stuff. stuff. But Which, by when the way, people finally... say that the government has the aliens and it's keeping it from us, that's not what I heard in those hearings. It's these private companies, which he said he'll name for Congress. He wouldn't name it publicly because he could go to jail. It's all classified. So he was very careful about what he said. But it's the companies that have these ships. It's not our government. And that I think people are missing the plot on. Crazy stuff. Well, first of all, I like that my taxes would go there because yeah, finally something cool. You know, but the main thing that I hate about the taxes that we have to pay is that you don't get to choose where. It, so you could be peaceful and it could be going to a war that you don't support. Right. I was vegan for a couple of years. It's going to meat and dairy subsidies, which I didn't support at the time. So it's just like you don't get to pick. But I would pick alien now i'm assuming the in between the lines here is that these private companies are getting their hands dirty and doing some crazy alien stuff which will then they will give to the government like a little tit for tat we gave you money now you give us this alien laser that you repurposed well that's the thing so they're using it for technology possibly that they're developing i mean that's what we don't know and i think that's the problem like our government at least there is a chain of command that goes back to the taxpayers that goes back to the people Private companies can do whatever they want. So not only the fact that we have these secret programs, but they are being run privately. And that's the problem. Because this technology that they're talking about is insane. It's unreal. Like light years ahead of us, truly. Yeah, like scaring naval commanders intense. And so that is not something that I want in these defense contractors' control. Like I do want it in government control. Like. There's so I think it happened in the 1980s where it became cool to be against your own government, you know, and I just think we need to stop that because we're trusting private companies entirely too much. Those are dictatorships. CEOs can do what they want. They have a board of directors. But like unless you're an investor, unless you're investor class, you don't have any say in that. You have to buy your way in. At least in the government, every one of us does have a say. So even saying that, like, we don't get to choose where our taxes go. Yes, we do. All funding is supposed to start in the House of Representatives, the part of Congress we pay the least amount of attention over or to, uh, but we have the most power over because in the House of Representatives, every member of the House only represents about 700,000 people. It's done by population. So you do have someone that you can vote for that's supposed to be making these decisions, and we have just abandoned that privilege well, you to the elderly. <laughs> but it really resonates because I feel like I've even fallen into the trap of being like, oh, my God, like I like Facebook more than the government, for example, because at least with Facebook, like I have a help center. It's easy to like talk to someone there. I can reach someone on the phone, live chat. They give me like a newsletter of what's happening. I, I like know the product roadmap and the updates. And if the government does all those things, but they make it so hard, right? Like I remember trying to attend different like hearings in Manhattan and you have to like go to the website, then you have to download a PDF. Then the PDF is out of date that tells you when these things are happening. I was trying to pay my taxes. The, you know, URL didn't work. I'd had to call the phone number. I was on hold for an hour. That didn't work. The website didn't work. Then I ended up being charged because I paid my taxes late. So I think for the, my main thing has always been like, send out a newsletter, like send out and like have a marketing department and send out a newsletter to like every citizen who wants it, which like is easy to understand once a week. And it's like, hey, your money went to, you know, this park and this and that. Like it's all available, but it's podcasts like yours that make it easy to understand and compromise, like comprehend and make it bite size. So I just wonder why they don't do that, because they would have more fans if they did. I think it goes back to we are we have a government that's run by dinosaurs. Like, yeah. it really is. Like, I had a really tough time downloading videos from the Senate because they're using a video platform that was invented, like, literally in the 90s. It's like quick and no, Yeah, it's like Akamai something. And so all, like, I was... need live streaming Twitch on, like, all of these different... Yeah, like, like, even C-SPAN. It's like, put it on YouTube. I love the people at C-SPAN. They're doing the best they can. <laughs> um, but so the House of Representatives does put most of the videos on YouTube. But then, like, when it switches hands, so it's like... Uh, it's dumb. The committee websites will switch from being controlled by Democrats to Republicans, and they act like they own the committee's website. And so it breaks all the videos. It's insane what happens there. 
I think we don't have tech savvy people in government because well, it's, because it's because of values, right? Yeah. The elderly people value their government and we don't. We see the government is the problem. And that is a problem because until government becomes in vogue and the cool people want to get involved in it, we're going to surrender it to the dorks, the evils and the olds. So, you know, like, why aren't the cool features that we know could exist happening there? Okay, because so where are the cool people to make it happen? Let's brainstorm. Here's my idea. The hottest person in the world, just put him in the Senate. Doesn't matter what political part, doesn't matter what he's doing. Then people would tune in. You would have Gen Z making thirst traps of him standing up and adjusting his tie and things like that. I think if we got five unbelievably hot people in government, it could do wonders for the, you know, the PR of it all. Have you heard of Jeff Jackson? No, he's hot. Oh my God, he's I mean, I'm gonna look such a right babe. Now. He's about 40 years old. He does the it's best. A spring chicken in government, basically. Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, I love him. And he's all over social media telling people what's happening in the background. Like, he did one the other day. He was like, by the way, all these people that you see making all this fuss on the news, behind closed doors, they're completely normal people. It's all fake. So he's telling us what he's discovering as a new congressman on TikTok. I mean, he could be your babe. Because okay. I love him. <laughs> That's, I'm going to ride for him. Today's episode is brought to you by Hair Love. If you are experiencing hair thinning or maybe you're like me and you want to do the Sophia Richie bun because you've been seeing it on TikTok and then you slicked all your hair back and you went, oh dear God, that's my hairline. You can rest easy, okay? Because Hair Love is here to help you. They've got a bunch of different products that are going to help you have healthy, thick, voluminous hair you can take their growth complex so this is going to be uh two capsules that you take a day with eight ounces of water and they have a whole schedule on their website of how this is going to work so what you're going to be expecting from one to three months in strengthening your hair um, three to six months how you have fullness new growth around the hairline and what it's going to be like in six plus months they also have um hair brushes on there anything like silk scrunchies or luxury hair towels they even have a nourish and repair serum if you follow me on tiktok and you saw me dancing to timbaland with my hair all oiled up it was hair love baby so if you want any of your own you can go to hairlove.com slash fluently or you can use code fluently and that will get you 15 percent off site-wide with your first subscription order so go check things out at hairlove.com slash fluently now, why have you here? We were talking a little bit beforehand. Political gossip that I've heard, I want to see in the blind items if it lines up with anything that you would think. So, okay. Okay. We've done different episodes on um, the Clintons, Obamas, Trump. I heard that Bill and Hillary haven't slept in the same bed for about 20 years. It's very much just a business relationship. Would you say I or nay to use a Bill language? I mean... I have no insider knowledge. Okay. Going off but vibes. I mean, the pantsuits okay. from HRC. Come on. We've also, I've also heard that Hillary Clinton is okay with Bill cheating on her because she, and this is a quote that a friend of a friend heard from Bill, Hillary gets more chicks than I do. Well, I mean, it is kind of fascinating. All of that's open, out in the open. He openly cheated on her with an intern there was a whole impeachment about it. They're still together. So, I mean, right? That's what I think. Now, I heard a very interesting tidbit that, you know, Melania and Trump, I feel like it's not sunshine and rainbows there. I heard a rumor that she was hooking up with Barron's private tutor, and the tutor would, like, follow them around everywhere, and that's why the tutor was always with them, because he was Melania's little side piece. Wow. Yeah. I know nothing about that. Okay. That's fun, though. That is a very fun one. If you want some fun gossip, um, oh, what's the podcast? Um, uh, call, call Me Daddy. Have call you ever? Daddy. Call Her Daddy. Yeah. Yeah. Aubrey O'Day, of all people. Oh, she's She was, like, in love with Hunter Biden. Uh, no, it was Donald Trump Jr. Oh, Donald Trump. That was it. Donald Trump Jr. Yeah, yes. they dated, and she went on that podcast and dished. It was good. She's been talking about him for like years. And she also talks about him in such a strange way where she's like, he is this like evil, hateful, uh, very like homophobic man, but only because he was raised that way by like other people. And in his soul, he's actually good. And I'm like, I don't think you know what like a good person is, you know? She's, I don't think she does. She very much rides for him and is still in love with him. And I could see them getting back together. 
Well, in the podcast, she basically says that because they were together pre-Trump running for president, and she said he was a different person back then. So she's not in his life since the presidency, and she's watching me. She's like, I don't know who this person is. I knew a different person. She's like, I don't know if he's actually changed, if he's leaning into this persona, whatever it is. But like, I don't know that man. I know a different man. What about the rumors? And this has always fascinated me, the rumors that Donald Trump is a Democrat has given money to Hillary Clinton before, mm -hmm. but just thought that being a Republican would be better. So that was what he decided the political party he ran under. And I even heard this fantastic little theory that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump used to at least be like a little bit buddies. I think at least when you're rich, like, you know, everybody who's rich, like you go to the same. Party. They're New York rich. Yeah. yeah. So I think just... Trump was. Oh, a Hillary and Bill were at Trump's wedding. Not crazy. Yeah, they're friends. So I heard a theory that they wanted Trump. They were going to prop him up as the Republican candidate. And then he was just going to be so delusional and insane that obviously it would be easy for her to knock him out and she would win and become president. But instead, it just got out of hand. And that's why Trump was like so surprised and he didn't have like a speech prepared for when he became president because they both were in on it. Could you see something like that happening? So I don't think they did that together, but there was a, there was a name for that. It was the Pied Piper theory. Like that is what the Clinton campaign was thinking. They wanted Trump to be the nominee and they were like, oh, because Hillary will be a shoe in And you remember in 2016, we were told by everyone that she had it in the back. Like, honestly, it's like so cringe now. And she's like, this little girl is going to be president. And I was like, oh, my God, Ugh. delete your account. Like, it didn't happen. <laughs> I know. I like I feel bad for her as a person. But there were major problems with Hillary as a candidate. And I took a lot of heat after that election because I remember I watch a lot of C-SPAN that she was essentially promising to go to war with Russia over Syria at the time. Like she was telling the leaders of the world in public speeches that were aired saying, like, we're going to institute a no-fly zone. And at the time, who was flying over Syria, protecting Syria? It was Russia. And so I wasn't down for another war. You know, there were real problems with her as a candidate. And the way that the DNC really made it kind of impossible for Bernie to win. We're we talking about the WikiLeaks emails where I think it was basically confirmed that yeah. somebody in those debates was emailing Hillary's team and kind of giving her Donna Brazil at CNN was yeah, giving her the questions ahead of time. Um, we found out that the Clinton campaign was essentially controlling the money in the Democratic primary. So it was more than just, you know, you get the questions ahead of time, like, who cares? We're talking about the money of the DNC being controlled by one of the candidates. Do you think like, that's you can... corruption? Um, like, have you heard of the Clinton body of conspiracy? Course. <laughs> I'm saying course. that's a lot of planes to go down and people to be hit outside of Starbucks and suicides to happen to people in your circle. Like, <laughs> I'm not saying that all of them were assassinations, right? Like, I've only seen a few episodes of Killing Eve and House of Cards, so I don't know if this happens as much as it does in the entertainment cycle. But that's a lot of people to die. I mean... I don't think any other politician has had that many people close to them die in suspicious circumstances. I have no idea, honestly. But I do know that the Clintons, when um, Bill was in charge, was bombing countries that we didn't declare war on. So have they killed people? Yeah, that's yeah, that's true. Have they killed people? Technically, yes. Yeah. So it's like when they do it on a massive scale, we go like, well, that's just a part of the job. But when they do a one off of like. Like, have they killed people? Yes, absolutely. All these people have. Yeah. And they do it so brazenly and, yeah, and in our names. That what do you think of the WikiLeaks scandal? Like, I personally think WikiLeaks is incredible because I know so, and I love that it's out there. But I saw so many people giving Julian Assange flack for revealing this information. And I just think that if these are public servants who are doing something that's corrupt, we should be able to know about it. Yeah, we have an overclassification problem in the United States because there's not supposed to be this many secrets. What we're finding is that things are being classified because it would pink, make politicians or political parties look bad. And we're supposed to have all the information except for the most secret stuff like, you know, where are we keeping our nuclear bombs and how do you turn them on? That needs to be classified. Yeah. But they're classifying things. And we know this from WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, Glenn Greenwald. We know that they're classifying things that absolutely do not have to be classified. And so WikiLeaks was a necessary service. And, you know, during the Bush years, Julian Assange was a hero of the Democratic Party. Yeah. But once it turned on that party, then he became 
you know, an enemy of both parties, and now he's a political pr prisoner. So um, I think we have a problem with these two parties. They're both subservient to the investor class. They're both subservient to corporations. We have a corporate power problem here in the United States, and both parties are doing it. Um, you know, our, our presidential debates, they used to be run by the League of Women Voters, and they really had a I mean, there were a couple problems, but they were pretty good back in the day. And there were the qualifications were clear. And then the Democrats and our Democratic Party and Republican Party got together and basically boycotted the League of Women Voters. The way they it retook it over some things, but not others. It's like, oh, very interesting. Yeah, they've together rigged the system so that only a Democrat or a Republican could win at the presidential level. But is I feel like that one's lost. I feel like we've lost the presidency and I don't focus on it much. Yeah. We have not lost our Congress. And so that's why I do what I do, because I the power, the money. The president can't do anything without the money that comes from Congress. The money controls the world and the Congress controls our money. So that's just like, I wish we would pay more attention to it. And and I, I'm i only one person. I Congress governs everything. So I have to learn about so many different topics. I wish I could produce more podcasts because there's so much that happens that I don't see that I could never cover um, there could be 50 of my podcasts and we still wouldn't get it all. So there's so many news stories there. Um, so and it's all fascinating. Yeah. You just have to get through the politicians and their stupid speeches. The language. And the, oh, the yes. And then state this and then state that. I mean, God, it really is a snooze fest. So that's why we need the hotties in there. Well, and so and maybe dance numbers, too, and like some sexy outfits. Well, and I so I'm I'm doing these episodes now that I'm getting better at where I watch a hearing and I just take out all that fluff yeah, and just give you the good stuff. That's what I did with the UFO hearings. And I feel like millionaires could do this too. You know, like these journalists that have so much money and staff and like, I wish we would just take the eye of Sauron off of the presidency and focus it on Congress. I think we'd be a lot better off. That's where our power is. Do you think Joe Biden is wearing a diaper? sometimes <laughs> i was gonna say if we're gonna end on the day if we're gonna take the eye off of the presidency like joe biden's the one to do it there's really nothing to look at there's really nothing to hear i just feel like um you know with donald trump you couldn't like every day he was saying something sensational and i feel like this is like we have like a calm not all there president so it's easy to like look at congress so i feel like maybe that could be the uh the mantra for the next year i would hope so now we'd be better off. Um, and if you are concerned about Biden or Trump or any of these goofballs that are going to be, you know, debating in the Republican Party, if you're worried about that, focus on Congress, because that is the check on the presidency. I don't think we have any good options right now. So if you get us a good Congress with good people in it, which I do think is possible, I don't think you have to be crazy to want to be someone that, you know, makes the laws and... There's so many good people with good ideas. And if we empower them, Congress has enormous potential to make our lives better. So that's why I do this. Like I mourn the the power that we're wasting, the time that we're wasting having garbage people in in Congress. Like if we had good people, we could have the same level of health care that the rest of the world has. Like we could stop bombing other countries. Like we have the power to do this. But it's not in the presidency. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Today's episode is brought to you by Chime. As the summer is coming to an end and we are entering September here, I got that back to school feeling where I kind of want to do something, turn over a new leaf, do something that's good for me. That for myself and others is going to be building credit. And that's something that you can do with the secured Chime Credit Builder Visa credit card. So this is a way to build your credit score safely with everyday purchases and on-time payments. Plus, there's also no annual fee, interest, or credit check to get started. So if you want to get started building your credit up, you can open a Chime checking account with at least a $200 qualifying direct deposit to get started. You can get started at Chime.com slash Fluently. That's Chime.com slash Fluently. The Chime Credit Builder Visa Credit Card is issued by Stride Bank, member FDIC. Chime checking account and $200 qualifying direct deposit required to apply. Out-of-network ATM withdrawal fees may apply. On-time payment history may have a positive impact on your credit score. Late payments may negatively impact your credit score. Results may vary. Okay, rapid fire questions for you. Okay. Um, one, do you think we'll ever have a three-party system or more? We already do. 
Well, as in it would actually be, you know, would be getting, I don't know, a libertarian Green Party, whatever, up there on the stage. Like, do you think there would ever be a debates with three people at the end rather than two? At the presidency level? Maybe. Maybe. Only you could see it in our lifetime. Yeah, because a lot of people are figuring out that the Democrats and Republicans are the same side of the corporate coin. Yeah. Um, I think Cornell West is going to be an interesting one to watch. Okay. Um, Hunter Biden's laptop. Have you seen anything from it? Uh, saw some dick. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, follow up question. Would you hit? <laughs> um, there was a time in my life where I was partying enough to hit a hunter. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. He's not bad looking. He's... Yeah, when he's not like taking a selfie from this angle, um, yeah, he needs some camera work. He needs he needs a little bit of like lighting and maybe some like moisturizer. I say as someone with like the driest skin on the planet. Yeah, just like hot or not, I'm gonna say hot. The personal yeah. problems, like it would be a one and done. Mm-hmm. But um, <laughs> yeah. White House, if you had to revamp it, what color would you go for? Uh, I like the white. I think it's beautiful. So, so maybe you'd do it off white, a cream, an eggshell. I would like to have it be like white and then just a red rose garden. Oh, red rose. Very President Snow from Hunger Games. I right? Like so, yeah. I think Snow was on to something. Yeah. It was cool. Uh, Michelle Obama, would you eat a meal that she made or no? Because you think it would be too healthy. Oh, I absolutely would. I want a health kick. And uh, favorite politician of all time as in someone that you would love to just like hang out with, shoot the shit with? Honestly, Anthony Weiner. <laughs> I know we just talked about him, but he is the most entertaining person. Yeah, well, I mean, other than the fact that he was in jail for engaging with a minor. Yep. There's definitely problems there, yeah. but he's funny and wait, he's in jail for that? He went to jail. Oh. Because this was after the 2000. So I think 2011, it was like leaked, you know, his messages with the blackjack dealer, the... I'm not going to say the C-O-C-K word here, but like tons of that. And then I think it was in 2016 or whatever. And then this was when him and Huma got divorced because it came out that he was having an online relationship relationship with a 16 year old. And on Skype, he would like be asking her to do explicit things. And he went to jail for a bit. Oh, interesting. I was, OK, so I didn't actually know that part. Once he left Congress, I was kind of not paying attention to him yeah um cause, but he was one of my favorite congressmen he would say just have you seen his own right face i think it's just called wiener i have not it is fascinating because um you get to like watch a narcissist live and i found it very interesting that in his sex scene with all of these women he would always ask them he'd be like first of all a are you horny b what are you wearing c did you catch me on tv i did a really good job and it was just like oh my god like he's obsessed with himself you know yeah he did have an ego for sure i just feel like he would be one of the most likely people if you got him in a room that would just dish yeah on all those people he just seemed like a gossip who didn't care about keeping do you ever watch secrets um project veritas or whatever videos where like, i they don't get... <laughs> so it's like this group where like they get people drunk or like they have like spies go out on like hinge dates with like politicians or people who work for the government and then they'll secretly record um i don't know like that's why i don't like, watch them they're kind of like, awful it's, it's, oh, but it's very much the stuff that putin would be like yeah that's a good tactic you know it's very like yeah he's an assassin type of thing but i feel like they could get anthony weiner on camera yeah. Now I regret saying that I would hang out with the pedophile. So you didn't um, know. You didn't know. I didn't know. But you know, I would actually hang out right now with AOC. Yeah. She's a former bartender. I think she's another one that'll be like, this person's a jerk. Like, I think she would be a fun one to get into a room. And talking about someone hot in politics, she's, she's so, sorry, sorry to say that. She's like a very accomplished woman. And I'm like, but she's so hot. I know. I love um, her. Andrew Yang, your thoughts on him? Um... I like that he's trying something different with the forward party. I don't know if it's going to work. Yeah. Um, universal basic income is an interesting... Like, he thinks outside the box. I'm, yeah. I'm into that. He brainstorms different ideas. I think it's very interesting to hear him. I, I feel like with the two-party system, it's like, they did wrong, they did wrong, and he's just brainstorming solutions. So, yeah. Jen Bryany, Congressional Dish Podcast, anything that we can look forward to that you're going to be working on next, or do you just kind of cover, you pick and choose as they come out? I pick and choose as I come out, but I also want to mention that I host a, I co-host another podcast called We're Not Wrong. We're Not Wrong. 
Yes. And my co-hosts are Justin Robert Young. He hosts Politics, Politics, Politics. So that's his subject. I do government. And then we also have Andrew Heaton, which is like he's libertarian leaning, but he's a historian. He's from Oklahoma. He's kind and gorgeous. And they're just we're all friends. Get him, get him in Congress if he's good looking. Well, we we might try. <laughs> um, he's been a staffer before. And so the three of us, we have these great debates where we disagree but we're friendly yeah don't you love that i love them so much yeah i love hearing stuff like that on podcasts because sometimes you do wonder what is the other side thinking because i only see like tweets from the worst side of it Mm -hmm. so i think that that's great and you said that's called we're not wrong yes you guys do weekly episodes yes we do and that's where i let my hair down and i have fun like congressional dishes i'm much more serious on that one but i'm a real goofball with the boys so okay i'm excited to check that out thank you so much for coming on fluently forward and if anybody wants to um, check out, obviously, the different podcasts that you do, I highly, highly recommend it. I, I feel like such a hero every time I listen because I feel like I'm doing something like good and educational. Well, and I don't think it's dorky as dorky as it sounds like it would be. No, it's not. It is interesting and it is scandalous. And for anybody who has that conspiratorial forward thinker hat, um, it's great to listen to because, like you said, I think it's empowering the fact that we can change and we should be involved with our government. Yeah, totally. Awesome. Thank you for having me. Thank you for coming on. So, everyone, thank you for listening, and we will see you next week for a new episode of Fluently Forward. Bye, guys.